Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of February 2023. The first paper for today is the hydroxylation of aryl chlorides. Some highlights of this paper include the conversion of aryl chlorides and bromides to the corresponding phenols. This paper also features nickel-2 catalysis as well as the use of phenylsilane as a promoter for this reaction. This chemistry complements some of the existing hydroxylation methods that have been reported recently, such as the photochemical hydroxylation of aryl chlorides recently reported by Macmillan and co-workers, and the difference for this paper is the use of thermal conditions in the absence of light. The scope of this chemistry is fairly good. Here are some complex examples from their paper, although they have many other examples in their full manuscript. Heteroaromatic compounds as well as complex functional groups are well tolerated, and I think it goes without saying that this method is fairly appealing as a consequence. The catalyst for this reaction is nickel-2 bromide bound to this diamino bipy ligand, and phenylsilane was used to promote it. Now, in addition to aryl chlorides, which are commercially available and synthetically accessible, aryl bromides were also demonstrated. Here's some examples from the manuscript, although there are many other examples in the full paper that you might want to check out. Functional groups as well as complex scaffolds were well tolerated, and this is something that I was really happy to see in this paper. They did find that aryl chlorides containing electron-rich methoxy groups were not able to be hydroxylated in the ortho and para position, but they did have some examples in their paper where they had meta-substituted methoxy arenes, and, and those were able to work all right. Here's an example where we still have an electron-rich system, but, but nonetheless, this aryl bromide was able to be converted to the corresponding phenol quite easily. Initially, we start with this nickel-2 pre-catalyst that's converted to the active catalyst through reduction with phenylsilane. This nickel-1 complex, which is the active catalyst, can then intercept an aryl chloride or bromide and undergo an oxidative addition to the nickel-1 center. Once this nickel-3 center is formed, water is able to displace one of the halide ligands, and through reductive elimination, we're afforded with our phenol. This should regenerate the nickel-1 catalyst, now, it's possible that once the nickel-3 catalyst is formed, that this can disproportionate with some of the nickel-1, and this would reform the nickel-2 catalyst. So it's necessary to have some triphenylsilane to make sure that nickel-1 is constantly being formed so that the reaction is able to occur. This is an air-sensitive technique that needs to be done under nitrogen, and this is one of the reasons why. Nickel-1 is involved in this reaction, and the authors confirm this by EPR. So I quite like this paper. I think phenols are quite a... And hopefully this can be used to access some phenols that people have been struggling to prepare. If you plan on using this method, make sure you let me know down in the comments. The second paper for today involves decatungstate and late-stage methylation. This is a very important paper, and some highlights of this paper include late-stage CH methylation of amines and ethers. We have decatungstate being featured, as well as nickel-mediated SH2. So you may not be familiar with decatungstate chemistry. Decatungstate is a photocatalyst which can readily abstract hydrogen atoms from weak CH bonds. One example is the alpha position of this n bach amine. The photocatalyst, once excited, is able to abstract this hydrogen atom, forming a carbon-centered radical. The decatungstate still goes through some disproportionation and eventually reaches the ground state of the catalyst, although it can do some other chemistry which will be taken advantage of in this case as well. The reduced photocatalyst is able to disproportionate forming a further reduced decatungstate catalyst, which is then able to undergo a single electron transfer reducing this redox active ester, which is a derivative of acetic acid, to a methyl radical. This methyl radical is able to react with the nickel-2 catalyst, forming a nickel-3 methyl complex. This nickel-3 complex essentially will hold on to the methyl radical for a while, and it's essentially stabilizing the methyl radical. So now that we have this nickel-3 with the methyl bound, this alpha amino radical that was generated earlier is able to attack at the methyl, reducing the nickel to a nickel-2 species, and forming compound 11 here, where we formed a late-stage methylated product. You might be wondering why the radical that we formed earlier doesn't also bind to the nickel. Well, it does, it's just not as strong of a bond as the methyl radical is. So since the methyl radical is going to bind to the nickel more preferentially, we're able to selectively cross-couple the two different radicals through this SH2 process. It's a little bit like SN2, where the alpha radical is the nucleophile, and the nickel-3 complex is essentially like the leaving group. So the radical attacks the methyl group, this reduces the nickel back to nickel-2, and the catalytic process continues forward. So this is how they're able to sort the radicals and cross-couple two different radicals in this process. 
This is a nice fusion of decatung state photocatalysis, which is quite a powerful method in synthetic chemistry, and it's nice to see this crossed over with SH2 catalysis. In terms of the scope, the authors demonstrated that this was applicable to a wide range of compounds with pharmaceutical relevance. You might have a drug which is performing all right, maybe you're seeing some undesired metabolism, maybe you want slightly stronger binding, and wouldn't it be great if your lead compound had an extra methyl group? Now most of the time you'd have to design the synthesis from the ground up. Since it's a new compound, it's a new analog, you have to redesign the synthesis. But wouldn't it be great if you could just take your lead compound and add one methyl group right at the end? That's exactly what this paper does. So sometimes this can impart desirable properties to a drug molecule, maybe it's something you want to assess. This is a potential method for doing that. So in addition to alpha amino compounds, they also demonstrated alpha oxymethylation. And here are some examples of that. If you'd like to see even more examples, I'd encourage you to check out the full paper where they also demonstrate other examples. Additionally, one of the things that they did is they showed that the desmethyl analog of suvorexant, 45A, was able to be converted to suvorexant using their process. There's a couple other alpha amino positions which were able to be methylated. And if you wanted to try designing different ligands for receptors, this would be a way to access a library of compounds which could be separated by HPLC. So while this might not resemble the final process route that gets used, this could be really useful for discovery, as you can rapidly access several different analogs of a drug to help elucidate possible candidates for your final drug structure. The third paper for today is the metathesis of ester containing olefins. Some highlights of this paper include olefin metathesis of tri-substituted olefins with an ester containing olefin to afford Michael acceptor type products. In this paper, a molybdenum-based metathesis catalyst was used as a means to form Z-alkenes. The idea in this paper is that it's easier to carry out a synthesis where you have an alkene like this through to the end, but then at the last stage you can do metathesis with another olefin containing a Michael acceptor, and this can put a Michael acceptor right on your final product. So this might be something really useful synthetically. Let's talk about what the authors did. So they explored a scope of different compounds, and I have to say that the ligand choice for this complex is quite bizarre. I spent some time looking at this complex, and I have to say, I'm amazed. I also want to say that I love the part of the paper where they say it's mobist time, and proceed to mob all the other molecules. I don't remember where in the paper that was, but I'm pretty sure that that was in there. Anyway, the authors demonstrated olefin metathesis across a wide range of tri-substituted olefins, and were able to prepare several different Michael acceptor containing products in a method that was amenable to complex molecules and a wide variety of functional groups. Now, in some instances, they found that it was better if they had an alkene to promote the reactions, so sometimes they required a promoter, and in this case, not only did they do methyl esters, they also demonstrated substituted esters, as well as thioesters, and this silated ester. Now, I definitely am not doing this paper justice because the authors did so much in this one paper, and I'd encourage you to go read the full manuscript. Additionally, one of the important papers for this episode was also published by the same group this month, and that involves vinyl bromides. I would encourage you to check out that paper as well. You can find it at the end of the video, as well as in the video description. The fourth paper for today is another very important paper, and I've humbly titled this Radical Addition to Alkenes. Some highlights of this paper include the design of a sulfonium-based reagent for nucleophilic displacement, as well as a two-step one-pot process for CC bond formation and nucleophilic addition. What the authors do here is discuss the issue of polarity mismatch. You want to add a nucleophilic radical to an olefin with an electron donating group. This isn't something that's well suited. So what the authors do instead, they add in a nucleophilic radical to their engineered olefin, which contains this neopental sulfonium as a leaving group, and in a subsequent step in the same pot, they're able to displace this sulfonium with various different nucleophiles. The design of this reaction is as follows. Under photochemical conditions, they're able to decarboxylate carboxylic acids, generating a carbon-centered radical. The carbon-centered radical is then able to engage with this vinyl sulfonium, forming a new alpha-sulfonium radical. This is then able to be reduced through the photocatalyst's radical anion, forming an illid which can readily be protonated in the medium. Once this has occurred, this is their intermediate 6, and in a second step in the same pot, they're able to displace the sulfonium as a leaving group with various different nucleophiles. What I really want to highlight is the utility of this leaving group. So the authors report in their SI how they synthesize this. They use bis-neopental sulfide. Apparently you can do a substitution at a neopental center, as long as you have a sulfur nucleophile. They take this bis-neopental sulfide, alkylate it with bromoethyl triflate, 
and through the displacement of the triflate and subsequent elimination with potassium bicarbonate, they're afforded with their vinyl sulfonium triflate 9C. The main thing I took away from this is you can displace a triflate with bisneopental sulfide and then displace this with various different nucleophiles of interest. Now you might think normaline triflates are a fairly good leaving group on their own, and they are, although there's certain instances where it might be harder to form certain bonds through the use of a triflate. And so what the authors do is they add an radical to their vinyl sulfonium. Once the sulfonium adduct is formed, they're then able to displace the sulfonium as a leaving group. Here you can see they used vinyl bromide. Unfortunately, this just polymerized because, hey, we have a radical and an alkene. What does that do? Radical polymerization. But with the sulfoniums, that wasn't an issue. Now, the authors ran into issues when they had beta hydrogens available on their sulfoniums. And so this is why they went to the bisneopental sulfonium so that there's no beta hydrogens available. Now, let's talk about the scope of the reaction. The authors looked at various different carboxylic acids, you can find that in their full paper, but they examined sulfur-containing nucleophiles, oxygen-containing nucleophiles, as well as nitrogen-containing nucleophiles. What I really want to highlight here is the ethers as well as the alcohols, because they've been able to do a substitution of bisneopental sulfide with water successfully under relatively mild conditions. So you're able to form ethers, and you're also able to form alcohols from their sulfoniums. So that's a pretty big deal in my mind. We have a new leaving group, which has a lot of promise, bisneopental sulfonium. And I really hope that other groups look at using bisneopental sulfonium as a possible leaving group, as this might solve a lot of synthetic problems for a lot of people. I'd also be interested to know from the authors of this paper if they're currently looking at doing any other work with this, as this is something that looks really promising to me, and ether synthesis under mild conditions remains an unsolved problem in the field. This is less exciting for cases like phenols or carboxylic acids, where phenylates and carboxylates are already relatively nucleophilic. But in cases like aliphatic alcohols or water, this is extremely exciting in my mind. If this excites you, let me know down in the comments. So overall, I was really impressed with this paper, and I look forward to seeing other papers that the authors have in store. The fifth and final paper for today involves CH hydroxylation via nitroarenes. Some highlights of this paper include photocatalytic CH hydroxylation using nitroarenes as oxidants. Previously on the channel, we've covered two different papers discussing the cleavage of olefins to the corresponding aldehydes or ketones using nitroarenes as the oxidant. But here we have CH hydroxylation, which is a new mode of reactivity. The mechanism of this paper is as follows. Initially, the nitroarene is photoexcited to generate this di-radical species, which can undergo hydrogen atom transfer, forming a carbon-centered radical. This carbon-centered radical is then able to recombine with the remaining oxygen-centered radical, which can then undergo fragmentation, affording an alcohol. If anybody's looking for a potential project or extension of this, I'd be interested to see if the epoxidation of alkenes could also be accomplished using some sort of nitroarene. Now let's talk about the scope. The authors demonstrated a wide range of functional groups were tolerated, and for the most part you can see that benzylic oxidation is facile, Additionally, the authors demonstrated that tertiary CHs could also undergo hydroxylation. This is a transformation that would be quite challenging with contemporary methodology, aside from using something like sodium decatungstate, where we often have lots of side reactions happening due to poor selectivity. I personally find it quite exciting to see nitroarenes used as oxidants rather than your traditional nitro group chemistry, and I look forward to seeing what the community has in store for us in the future, and I look forward to seeing what sort of chemistry this will be used for in the future. In addition to the five important papers for this month, we have a number of honorable mentions. Too many to discuss in great detail, but these are all really great papers that I'd encourage you to check out if you have the time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Important Papers. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.